Wonderful, wonderful. Well, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, thank you also to Vail Summit Orthopedics for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, just a few words on who I am. My name is Dr. Fotis Suslian. Uh, I'm a board certified neurosurgeon in the Denver area. I finished my training at the University of Minnesota. And following my neurosurgical training, I completed an orthopedic, minimally invasive, and complex spine fellowship in Seattle, uh, Washington. I spent eight years at the only level one trauma hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, where I did crazy spine cases like this cement augmented thoracolumbar fusion on a 79 year old female with severe osteoporosis. That's very poor bone who was involved in a motor vehicle crash. She came to my office six months after her crash, almost paralyzed. She was wheelchaired in and she had severe back pain in addition to the paralysis. Uh, needless to say, uh, following uh, the surgery that I performed, her, her back pain resolved and uh, she was no longer paralyzed. Uh, since then, I've spent the last, uh, I've been very lucky, I've spent the last year and a half here in Colorado at another wonderful level one trauma hospital, St. Anthony Hospital with Neurosurgery One, uh, doing more crazy surgeries. Uh, this is me in the operating room during the heart of COVID in June of 2020. Uh, this is a 34 year old female who was ejected from her car and ended up having most of her eighth thoracic vertebrae, you can see it, uh, you can see it here, smashed into her spinal cord, not just her spinal canal. So I spent an entire Saturday removing all of these bony pieces of her, of her vertebrae from her spinal cord. And then I placed this expandable cage, kind of like a car jack, as you can see here. And you see there's none of this bone that you see here, it's all gone. Um, and I restored her spine, I restored the alignment, I stabilized her spine, and uh, by the way, uh, she's, uh, she's no longer paralyzed. But I'm here tonight to talk to you about one of the most commonly misdiagnosed causes of low back pain, the sacroiliac joint. This is something that I am very passionate about. Before I begin, I wanna make sure you're all aware I have no disclosures that pertain to this talk at least. So I wanna start by talking to you about a patient of mine with a 15 year history, that's 15, 15 year history of severe low back pain and radicular pain down the back of her leg that was diagnosed by doctors um, and dismissed by doctors years ago. Here is an MRI of her lumbar spine. This is a good quality MRI. This is looking at someone right down the middle of their spine. The stomach is over here. The skin of the back is over here. And, this, and the buttock is down here where you can see my mouse. The rectangles are the bones. See these rectangles, they're the bones. Grayish black pancakes are the discs in between the bones. See some of them are brighter, some of them are darker. The spinal cord and the nerves are the gray things right here. Spinal cord and the nerves are the gray things right here, the gray lines, these wispy lines. And the white is the fluid that surrounds and bathes uh, the spinal cord and the nerves and allows these nerves to float freely in here. You wanna draw a line down the back of the rectangles the back of these discs as I'm drawing with my mouse and you don't want to see anything bulging into the nerves. See this little bulge right here? This is L5, this is S1. So this patient has a small L5 S1 disc herniation. So finally around 10 years ago another spine surgeon offered her some hope. The surgeon performed an L5 S1 discectomy and the patient's leg pain improved slightly but her horrible back pain did not get any better. So she went back to her spine surgeon who at this point dismissed her. So she became addicted to narcotics. Because of her opiate addiction, she lost her job. Her own children wanted nothing to do with her and she eventually became homeless. All of this could have been avoided. So what is the differential diagnosis for any patient with low back pain? Differential diagnosis, by the way, means the potential etiologies or causes of someone's problem. The differential for a patient with back and leg pain is usually one of three things. First off, the lumbar spine can be the cause of back pain. So we have to rule out herniated discs, rule out spondylolisthesis or slipped spine, rule out spinal stenosis or a tight spinal canal. Here's another patient of mine. Again, this is an MRI of the spine looking right down the middle of someone's spine Stomach is over here, skin of the back is over here, the buttock is down here. Rectangles are the bones, grayish black pancakes are the discs in between the bones. 
Look at this, spinal cord is the gray sausage that you see here. You see the spinal cord, the gray sausage forms a cone and ends right here. Most people don't know the spinal cord does not travel the entire length of the spine. And this spinal cord ends at a beautiful location behind the L1 vertebral body, the L1 rectangle. We have the continuation of the spinal cord that looks like a tail of a horse. It's these gray lines that move our legs and allow us to pee and poop, etc. All right, it is called the cauda equina. Cauda, tail, equina, equestrian, tail of the horse. Anatomists love to do things like that. And again, the white fluid is where all of these nerves, these gray lines are freely floating in. You wanna draw a line down the back of these rectangles as I'm doing with my mouse, and you don't wanna see anything pushing into the gray nerves. So it does not take a neurosurgeon or spine surgeon or pain doctor or anyone to see that there's a problem here, right? So this patient has a herniated disc between L4 and L5. By the way, pain down the leg is called radiculopathy. Sometimes people refer to this leg pain colloquially as sciatica. So for this patient of mine with the L4-5 herniated disc, I performed an L4-5 microdiscectomy and the symptoms all went away. Here, you see the disc that I removed from this patient. The disc material is very consistent with what I like to tell people, bubblegum mixed with crab meat, and it has that consistency as well. The homeless patient I was talking about also had back pain and leg pain, but her symptoms were more back pain than leg symptoms. This should have been a clue to the fact that her pain was likely not due to the small herniated disc. <clears throat> back to the differential diagnosis for various etiologies of back pain. The second pain generator for the back is the hip. Usually hip arthritis causes back pain that radiates or travels to the front aspect of the, of the hip or groin. And lastly, up until now, the most undiagnosed pain generator for low back and leg pain is the sacroiliac joint. Notice I said back and leg pain. For decades, it was thought that the sacroiliac joint dysfunction only caused back pain, but we finally know that sacroiliac joint pain can be referred down the leg. Just like the sciatica pain that patients get from a herniated disc. So if someone has back pain and leg pain and the MRI does not show a conclusive or substantial herniated disc, or if someone has more back pain than leg symptoms, then we need to think about the sacroiliac joint as the pain generator. As a matter of fact, studies have shown that up to 30% of patients with low back pain, chronic low back pain, have the sacroiliac joint as the cause of their low back pain. So what is the sacroiliac joint? The sacroiliac joint is the connection between the spine and the pelvis. I like this animation. Let me see if I can get it to work. So again, the sacroiliac joint is where the spine meets the pelvis. It is highlighted here in white. So we have two sacroiliac joints, one on each side. We have multiple studies that show us that SI joint pain can be debilitating. The Oswestry Disability Index is a way for clinicians to measure and quantify how much disability someone has due to pain. An Oswestry Disability Index greater than 40 is considered severely debilitating. And there are studies showing that patients with chronic SI joint pain can have an Oswestry Disability Index greater than 50. Therefore, SI joint pain can be and usually is severely debilitating. The SI joint, like any other joint in the body, can become affected by a variety of forces, such as arthritis, or repetitive trauma, such as caused by running or golfing. Wait, what? Golfing? Yes, golfing. I have unfortunately had plenty of golfers on my operating table. Or car accidents. See how the force of the car accident is transmitted up the leg into the sacroiliac joint? Falls can also affect the SI joint. Another common reason for SI joint dysfunction is the SI joint being stretched out during pregnancy and childbirth. Lastly, everyone here remembers being on a seesaw. The further out someone is on the seesaw, the easier it is to lift a bigger person or multiple people. This is basic physics with the concept of the lever arm. The longer the lever arm, then a small amount of pressure will be translated to a larger amount of force further out on the seesaw. We have to remember my Greek ancestor, Archimedes, who said, give me a lever long enough 
and a fulcrum in which to place it, and I can move the world. So here is someone who was who fused from L3 to S1, good work, by another surgeon in another state. This patient was doing fine initially, but they came to see me because they developed severe sacroiliac joint pain. Why did this happen? This is because the stress of the fusion is causing sacroiliac joint dysfunction. The long fusion is acting like the smaller child sitting further away from the bigger girl. The bigger girl is the sacroiliac joint. So a small amount of force from the long fusion transmits a lot of pressure into the sacroiliac joint. We call this adjacent segment disease. As a matter of fact, studies have shown that up to 40% of people with a lumbar fusion can develop sacroiliac joint pain, especially if the sacrum is involved in the lumbar fusion because the sacrum acts as the fulcrum. <clears throat> Typically, the SI joint only moves about two to four degrees of rotation and about 1.5 millimeters, that's the, the length of a small white aspect of someone's uh, uh, fingernail, 1.5 millimeters of translation, side to side motion. But in people with SI joint pain, this relatively non-mobile diarthroidal joint may increase its movement just ever so slightly. But this slight degree of increased motion can cause severe pain. This video provides a nice animation. You're gonna hear someone else's voice. Don't freak out, it's not my voice. I'm gonna to try to fast forward to the, to the appropriate part. See that? See that right there? Good. Was that visible and could you guys hear this? Okay, so the next question becomes, can you see this motion of the SI joint on x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, any other imaging for that matter? The answer is no, because even when the motion is pathological, it is still too small a motion to be picked up on imaging, unless there's something like a clear-cut fracture. But even though we currently don't have any good imaging to pick up a dysfunctional sacroiliac joint, it does not mean we cannot diagnose sacroiliac joint pain. This is because sacroiliac joint pain is a clinical diagnosis, not a radiographic diagnosis. So how do we diagnose it? We diagnose it with a good history, a good physical exam, and a good SI joint injection. Regarding the history, I ask my patients to point to the location of their pain. And a patient with SI joint pain typically points to the dimples of the back. These are the sacral dimples. This is called the Fortin finger test. There are many activities that if you ask your patients can exacerbate SI joint pain, such as putting on socks, walking up or down stairs, prolonged walking. And actually, John Legend here is giving us two reasons for exacerbating SI joint pain, prolonged walking and bending over to pick up after his dog. Getting in and out of cars, especially fancy ones like this. Putting babies and children in and out of car seats. You would be surprised how many postpartum women I see in my clinic and fathers for that matter, or other mothers um, with, this, with this issue. So the theme of SI joint pain is pain with transition of motion. In other words, pain when going from seated to standing, bending, twisting. So this is the history component of figuring out if someone has SI joint pain. But what about the physical exam? <clears throat> There are five physical exam tests. Distraction, thigh thrust, Faber, compression, Gainsland. You don't need to know these. We call these maneuvers SI joint provocative tests. These five provocative tests are clinically proven or validated to demonstrate a high degree of sensitivity and specificity in regards to SI joint pain. This all means that based on the best literature we currently have, if at least three out of these five positive provocative maneuvers reproduce the patient's back pain, then there is a high likelihood that the patient's back pain is due to the sacroiliac joint. And for those primary care doctors, therapists, spine or pain doctors that are performing these maneuvers, please remember that you are not performing CPR. It is not repetitive thrusting motions to the hips 
or repetitive thrusting motions to the legs. Because unfortunately, um, repetitive thrusting maneuvers is how I was trained to perform these tests back in 2008 when I was in training. So rather, these provocative validated tests are performed with a slow gradual force with the patient supported comfortably on the examination table. Continued application of force should result in SI joint compression. Start with light pressure and gradually increase this pressure. It'll hold it for at least 30 seconds, sometimes a minute. And again, if the patient's back pain is reproduced by at least three of these five maneuvers, then there's a very high likelihood that the patient's pain is due to the SI joint. So matter of fact, at once a patient has three positive maneuvers, meaning three time after three maneuvers that reproduce the patient's pain, I stop. I don't even go to the fourth and fifth maneuver. According to the International Association for Pain, a patient who has an appropriate history of SI joint pain and at least three positive provocative maneuvers that reproduce SI joint pain, then a diagnostic sacroiliac joint injection is currently the last part of the diagnostic formula. A diagnostic sacroiliac joint injection is currently considered the gold standard for diagnosing SI joint pain and for when considering a potential sacroiliac joint fusion. This means that- Dr. Sophia? Yeah, yeah, uh, Dr. Draxton. Sorry, I was a little bit late. I was in the operating room. Okay, it's okay, uh, good to see you. Yeah. Uh, when you're doing a diagnostic injection, does that have to be done with x-rays and dye or can it be done in the office with say ultrasound or does it matter? That's a great question. So um, I would like to see what Dr. Rob has to say with this and then I'll, I'll give you my two cents. Um, it uh, definitely has to be done with some imaging guidance to make certain that you're in the SI joint. So it needs to be done with contrast if it's done under fluoro. Uh, there have been some recent studies that show that the, the actual, actually getting into the joint is more reliable with fluoro than with ultrasound. Um, although people do do it with ultrasound and it's probably better than not doing it with anything. Um, I think fluoro is more reliable at making certain you're in the joint. So I, I think from a diagnostic perspective, it's recognized that uh, fluoroscopically guided injections are most appropriate to diagnose. And, and I agree. Um, based on the most current literature, um, I'd want at least fluoroscopic guidance. Um, if it was me or my family member, fluoroscopic guidance would be the way to go. Thank you, that's a great question. So this means that based on two of the largest spine societies, NAS or the North American Spine Society and ISAS, the International Society of Advancement of Spine Surgery, if a patient has at least 50 to 75% reduction in their SI joint pain following an SI joint injection, then this not only further validates that the sacroiliac joint is the generator of the patient's pain, but then the patient is a potential candidate for a minimally invasive SI joint fusion which is where I come in and perform the minimally invasive sacroiliac joint fusion. So if we have known about this formula for diagnosing SI joint pain with supporting literature from 1984 to 2014, 15, why then are people still suffering from years of SI joint pain? It is because this information was just data up until a few years ago. There were different articles that all gave different pieces to a puzzle, but no one had the blueprint. In 2016, there was a prospective multicenter randomized controlled trial. Randomized controlled trials are the absolute pinnacle of evidence-based medicine. This study took all of the studies and data we learned about the sacroiliac joint over almost 100 years and created this wonderful picture. The primary endpoint of the study was a visual analog pain scale and Oswester Disability Index. Remember, we talked about the ODI, the disability at six months, 12 months, and 24 months following the initiation of the study between the two groups. The two groups were SI joint fusion with a titanium-based triangular implant versus conservative management, physical therapy, um, uh, medications, et cetera. The study found that for the group randomized to receive the minimally invasive SI joint fusion, pain was significantly improved versus the group that did not receive surgery at six months from surgery as well as 12 months from surgery, and even 24 months after surgery. A further breakdown of the study showed that the percentage of opiate usage stayed the same or increased by almost 
in the group of patients that did not have surgery. But the percentage of opiate usage in the patients who had a minimally invasive sacroiliac joint fusion decreased by 30% over 24 months. Most of the opiate benefit was within the first six months after randomization. These results are amazing. So this randomized controlled trial took all the studies and data we learned about the sacroiliac joint over the last 100 years and created this wonderful blueprint that allows us as spine providers to get appropriate patient selection. Because SI joint fusion outcomes is all about appropriate patient selection. I treat my patients as if I'm treating my own family. You will not get a surgery unless I think you can benefit from surgery. According to this randomized controlled trial, a patient who has an appropriate history of SI joint pain and at least three positive provocative maneuvers and an appropriate response to a diagnostic sacroiliac joint injection, then this is someone who is a candidate for a minimally invasive sacroiliac joint fusion. The other aspect that this study brought us is the technology of the triangular base titanium implant that was the implant used in the study. Look at this old school SI joint fusion. Look at these screws. They look like they came out of Home Depot, right? Historically, SI joint fusions were done with screws with a smooth shaft. The base, I don't know if you guys can hear that, so I apologize. I have a four-year-old in the house, so I'm sorry. Um, the basic physics of a screw, however, will not stop the inherent motion and rotation of the sacroiliac joint. But we actually need to stop the pathological motion and rotation of the sacroiliac joint, which remember normally two to four degrees. So just even a few more degrees, what we need to stop that is an anchor that a screw will not obviously stop because a screw is cylindrical which is where the titanium triangular based implant makes the world of a difference. See how the triangular implant looks like an anchor? The anchor stops the pathological rotation. It is for these reasons that Medicare, Medicaid, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Health Partners, United Healthcare, and a boatload of other insurance companies only reimburse for this iFuse SI bone implant. The one problem with this study is that there's only one company that produces this triangular implant. So it's a, it is an industry sponsored study. But if you are like me and you can rip apart a study and look at it from head to toe, I could not find too many problems with that. One last thing to remember, just because you may be the perfect patient for a minimally invasive SI joint fusion does not mean you get an SI joint fusion. In my practice and most insurance companies as well, you need to show at least three to six months of failed conservative therapy, including physical therapy, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Aleve, Motrin, and bracing prior to any surgical interventions. So basically, you need to have exhausted all conservative measures because fusions, even minimally invasive sacroiliac joint fusions, come with risks. One last thing to remember, if you don't fall under the formula for a sacroiliac joint pain that can improve from a sacroiliac joint fusion, then it doesn't mean there is nothing to do. I am a huge proponent of cognitive behavioral therapy in treating chronic pain. As a matter of fact, even if you're the perfect candidate for sacroiliac joint fusion, I will still not operate unless you have gone through cognitive behavioral therapy, which is clinically proven to help with chronic pain. But most people, especially during coronavirus, don't have the ability or time to go to a cognitive behavioral psychotherapist. So this is a book I recommend to all my patients. It is a self-directed version of cognitive behavioral therapy that my patients love. It is called Back in Control. That's a K there, Back in Control. And the author is David Hanscom, and I have, no, um, I have no stock in this book or anything like that. Lastly, we also have to remember another clinically proven aid for patients with chronic back pain, and this is spinal cord stimulation. This has helped countless patients who have failed all other treatment modalities for chronic back pain. And I'd like Dr. Braxton, if, if you can, if you can talk about this wonderful procedure, I would be grateful. Well, I mean, spinal cord stimulation is a medical device that it is designed to block your perception of chronic pain. It doesn't fix the underlying problem. So if there is instability, either in the spine or in the SI joint, I would always recommend fixing that first, unless the patient is just too sick or not healthy enough to undergo surgery. Spinal cord surgery uh, stimulation is always a two-step operation. There's a stage one and stage two. 
stage one is kind of more a, a trial, so to speak. And I, I kind of uh, call it, it's one of the few surgeries where you get to try it before you buy it. Basically, we put the leads in and it's hooked up to an external generator. And then um, depending on your surgeon, surgeon's practice in my practice, I do trials for seven to 14 days. And uh, we see if you're a responder. Now, uh, as Dr. Sosian pointed out, uh, the mental aspect is very important. And before we can uh, um, authorize somebody or indicate somebody for a spinal cord stimulator, we always get a psychological test. Just to ensure there's not uh, depression or anxiety um, or cognitive difficulty that would interfere with your ability to perceive pain uh, appropriately. If after the trial of spinal cord stimulation, the patient gets um, adequate relief um, of their pain and we have um, measures to look at increased functionality, decreased opioid use, um, improved sleep, and as well as um, the VAS or visual analog scale, where we say, you know, if your pain was an eight before surgery, was it now? And it needs to be at least a 50% reduction before I will re recommend that we put the implant in. If the patient uh, decides to go uh, through with the permanent implant, a generator, uh, about half the size of a deck of cards is inserted into the body, just like a pacemaker. Um, and we uh, then paste the spine. The generator is controlled with a um, external remote and we will start off with some initial programs. And from time to time, we reprogram the stimulator to give it its maximum benefit. But um, in folks where surgery is not an, uh, not an option or they've had surgery and it doesn't work, I find that um, uh, this is a really a great option. We, we, we note that about 80% of my patients respond to this therapy. Not everybody's a responder, and that's why we do the trial. Um, but, uh, and, and folks that respond, they, they seem to really like it. Um, of course, the generator is a medical device. It needs to be replaced. It depends on how much you use it. On average, it's about 10 years. It looks like we got a hand raised from uh, one of the attendings. But uh, let's see here. I'm gonna ask you to just kind of chat your question. I think that might be the, the easiest way to ask the question for the um, attendee that had their hand raised. If they can um, uh, just send, it, send a chat and then I can, I can read it out loud. Um, uh, and uh, with that, I'll also ask if there's any questions about spinal cord stimulator as uh, treatment for chronic pain. And chronic pain, my definition is really more than six months of pain that hasn't responded to conservative management. Oftentimes people have pain for even longer periods, but at least six months of chronic pain. Uh, we did have an attendee with their hand up. If they could just send a chat, there's a little, if you bring your cursor all the way to the bottom of the screen and hit chat, you can uh, ask a question. Thank you. Thank you, that's great. Dr. Rob, anything to add with spinal cord stimulation? No, nothing. Wonderful. Yes, thank you, Dr. Braxton, that's beautiful. No Okay, thank you. Um, now I want to quickly circle back to my patient with the almost normal lumbar MRI and severe back and leg pain. This is my patient who, remember, was an opiate abuser who was Dr. kicked Filsey, out. One yeah. more thing: there was a comment yeah. from the audience. Uh, Colleen just, and this is a quote. I, just, she says, "I love my SES after 30 years of uh, pain." So. Wonderful. Some of the folks SCS, spinal cord stimulator for, for the uninitiated, spinal cord stimulator. Dr. Brax, I'm going to use that. You can try it before you buy it. I, I like that. That's really good. So uh, um, this is my patient who, remember, was the opiate abuser, was kicked out of her own family. She was the first patient that I performed this minimally invasive SI joint fusion on a little over three years ago. She not only is completely off opiates for the first time in over decades, she also has a job, she's part of her family, et cetera. These are, there are countless stories and outcomes like this. So please, if you have low back pain that others are having a difficult time diagnosing, think about and ask about the sacroiliac joint as a pain generator. Thank you. I have one more slide, but I'd like to go through questions first. Um, and then I'd like Dr. Rob, if possible, to, to give a few, um, a few thoughts in here, and then I'll, I'll show my last slide. So. If we can, if we can figure out like what the what the questions are, that'd be awesome. 
Yeah, I'll try to moderate it when the questions come in and you can type your, your questions at any time through this uh, presentation. But if you have any questions, uh, don't be shy. Um, if you want it to be anonymous, I can keep it an, uh, um, anonymous, but just go to the chat function at the bottom and I'll read off your, your questions. Okay. Okay. Dr. Rob, do you want me to stop sharing my screen for a little bit? Um, yeah, I think I would, um, I'll go through a few other. Uh, Here, few other I stopped things. sharing my screen. Okay. <clears throat> Pretty big turnout tonight. Um, there has been a little bit of fatigue with all the Zoom meetings, but I think we had uh, at 1.63 participants in this. So that's a really great turnout. <laughs> Let's see. Is, the, is my uh, slideshow up there? Yeah, your, 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 your slides are up, but I think you have to do slideshow to, uh, put, to put it in presentation. There we go. Yeah. There you go. So I'm, I'm not going to reiterate uh, some of the things that Dr. Uh, Susleyan did just a wonderful job uh, speaking about, but um, you know, he talked about the anatomy of the SI joint, which he had, he had excellent, an excellent animation of that. But the, the joint, as you can see, is between the sacral bone and the iliac bone, hence the word sacroiliac joint. Um, just some more graphics for that. Um, this is a side view of the SI joint. You can actually see how large it is. Um, it's actually a, a pretty big joint. Um, there is some movement, as Dr. Suslian did um, uh, did indicate. Um, Dr. Rob, we have a, a question from the audience, and this is for either Dr. Rob or Dr. Suslian. I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah. I want to make this interactive to make it more interesting. We have a question from uh, Kim. What type of self-care can be done, i.e. exercise, to minimize SI pain? Well, pro probably, you know, pelvic floor stabilization exercises, um, obviously stretching, um, uh, strengthening your, your glutes, um, maintaining good hamstring flexibility. Those would be all things that you could do. There are people that wear sacroiliac joint lock belts. Uh, it's not a belt, a typical belt around your waist. It actually um, will sort of go around the, the pelvis area those are many things like a physical therapist would be able to, to coach somebody uh, to do for their own, um, for their own self care. That's Anything great. That, That's Dr. great. Susan? No, I, I completely concur what you just said. I'm a big proponent of the SI sling, but I think if you feel like you've got sacroiliac joint pain, or if that's been diagnosed before, seek a professional and look at the therapeutical options right? You can Google it. You can YouTube. Um, I know everybody's concerned with COVID to go seek a professional, but we've, we've come a long way. We wear masks. We, we protect our hands. Um, I think there's nothing wrong with, with seeing a professional, physiatrist, injectionist, et cetera, spine specialist um, to, to figure out a clear pathway of where to go because you don't want to fall into that funnel of just cycling and cycling and cycling. And before you know it, you've got chronic years lost to you. One of the first things patient will tell me when they get off the operating room table, which the surgery is about an hour procedure, is like, why the heck did I, didn't I do this surgery earlier? Or even just therapy, why didn't I have the appropriate therapy earlier, et cetera? So see a professional. Um, one other thing for Kim, we, we have a list of recommended exercises that we can email you. Um, if you reach out to our office with your email address, we can send those out probably to, as soon as tomorrow. Uh, thanks guys, thanks for answering that question. That was a great question. So I'll, I'll sort of blaze through some of this stuff because it's just reiterating some of the things that Dr. Susleyan said and getting to some of the things that I, that, that I would recommend as far as workup goes for SI joint. He did talk about the prevalence of SI joint pain uh, being much more prevalent than, than we otherwise used to appreciate, about 20 to 30 percent, um, somewhere in that, in that range. Um, when, when we talk about diagnosis, of course, one of the big challenges is that, is that the, in my opinion, and, and, and Dr. Braxton, Dr. Susan, and you can 
um, uh, uh, give some uh, way in on this. A lot of times there can be other sources of pain occurring simultaneously that sort of muddy the waters and you can have disc mediated pain and facet pain going on at the same time. So sometimes it's not just purely a sacroiliac joint problem. There can be multiple pain generators. Um, and so sometimes betting those things out and is, is challenging with patients. And that's, I think, where uh, the diagnostic injection that Dr. Susian referred to uh, becomes really, really important. Um, and and, I, and, and I, I don't rely on imaging as Dr. Susian uh, discussed. Really, there's no imaging test that, that proves the SI joint. However, I would say that I, I have seen the, the radionuclide scans um, and, and I know Dr. Braxton, you found these to be helpful as well. Sometimes they really do light up and at least point you in the direction that the SI joint may be an inflammatory joint. So um, we do sometimes get those, but in general, it's a clinical diagnosis um, based on your physical exam and the history. And more and more, the SI joint provocation tests are super important. And Dr. Susan went through those wonderfully um, and the reason is a lot of insurance companies now want us to document those tests before an intervention and after an inter intervention to document that they really do have SI joint pain. And also they do that as far as reimbursement goes as well. So, so those tests are super important. It's not okay to just point to the joint. Um, and, and he talked about the, those tests um, I, I do most of them, and if, if there's a patient that I've seen and I suspect their SI joint, I try to do these tests on them as well. And again, he showed them eloquently in his, his talk. Um, Dr. Rob, can I make a comment about the radionuclide tests? Yeah, please do. So it's, it's not a validated study for SI joint pain. You still need to have um, three of the five you know, standardized tests as well as a response to a therapeutic injection. But that's usually like a, um, I usually order that test when I'm not sure what's causing the pain, what's causing the problem. And, a, and it's usually an incidental finding. So I'm suspecting facet pain, or um, maybe I'm uh, suspecting another disorder called Bertolotti's. And, and, I, and I see that, the sacred, uh, that there's unilateral increased scintillation. That's what we mean by lighting up. Um, and then that's what, that's what I'll usually refer to Dr. Rob or Dr. Susian to, to do the more validated test, but it's not a it's not a validated test, but it it it, it does um, um, show changes on that scan. I think more research needs to be done to see if this could could replace um, some of the other things we do because it's um, essentially a non-invasive uh, test and it doesn't involve um, uh, it, it doesn't uh, inv involve a, a lot of anesthesia to to get it done. I would agree, Dr. Braxton. You know, I don't, I don't ever use any imaging study as a sole diagnostic tool, but it's part of the picture that might clue you in to, to the SI joint as being symptomatic. Um, you know, of course, the physical exam is probably going to be the most crucial uh, determinant, but eventually you need to do some injections. Um, you could do an intraarticular injection like Dr. Suslian referred to, I usually put some steroids in with my local anesthetic. Sometimes you'll get a prolonged result. Um, and there's also diagnostic uh, nerve blocks that I will do as well to determine if a patient may be a candidate for another procedure that I'll discuss in a, in, in a few seconds here. Um, but there really is no gold standard for, the, for diagnosis. Dr. Rob, there, sorry to interrupt you again. There's another... Um... Uh, question. Kathy uh, wants to know, what is the therapeutic injection? What if I am allergic to steroids? So the answer to that is the therapeutic injection is with corticosteroids. If you are truly allergic to steroids, you, you can't have a corticosteroid injection. Um, I, I have found that it may not be that you're truly allergic to steroids, but some of the the um, other um, uh, particulates mixed in with the steroids to keep them, keep their shelf life 
might be what your some of the other substances mixed in with them may be what you're allergic to. Um, but you, if you really are allergic to steroids, you can't have an injection. But that's not unusual that I won't do a, a steroid injection. You can have just local or I do lateral branch blocks, which is another technique to assess SI joint pain. Um, so I usually like to have two positive results for either one is an SI joint injection or two is an SI joint block of the lateral branches. And lateral branches are nerves that supply the sacroiliac joint. Um, this is just a representative of a SI joint injection, an intraarticular injection with the contrast within the joint itself. That's the needle. This patient had a fusion. And as Dr. Susan indicated before, people that are fused down to the sacrum, they'll have more stress placed on this joint and it can become a painful joint. Um, this is an intraarticular injection. Um, <clears throat> the joint does hold about two cc's, not a ton. I usually put some steroids with local in it. It has to be done, in my opinion, under x-ray guidance. Uh, you have to get into the lower aspect of the joint and the joints are highly irregular. There's a lot of variability and there's a lot of thick ligaments. So you can't always get in there, but it's rare that I don't get into a joint. Um, the, um, they can be therapeutic, but I think there is some question as to whether they're going to give you long-term results. I don't find that they're ever a permanent solution to SI joint pain, but they're really, I use them a lot to facilitate physical therapy to work on strengthening the pelvic floor and the core. Um, the duration varies greatly. There is no way to predict duration. And again, I'm not sure that they're long-term management, but what I do think in, <clears throat> in people to consider that you don't really, and no pun intended, you're not burning any bridges with looking at the SI joint and treating the innervation of the joint or the nerve supply of the joint. Um, the joint is, is innervated very richly over the back aspect of it. Uh, there is some anterior innervation, which we really can't get to, but the, the joint is innervated um, by little nerves, and this is just a representative of a study that shows the, the little nerves that come out of one of the nerve holes and how, how sort of random they are on one side as opposed to the other. Unfortunately, they don't have a reliable uh, supply of nerves between people or between uh, sides. So it's sort of in a plexus. And what we do is we is we, we try to treat along the borders where these yellow ellipses are by cauterizing the little nerves using radio frequency energy. So I'll literally use a little probe and I'll go sort of in a clock around these, what we call foramen and ablate little nerves and one right up here too. And that basically severs the nerve connection from the joint. And this is just showing the position of some of the lesions that we would do. And the size of the lesion is actually fairly large. Uh, the, the technique I use is with a, a cool leaf or cooled RF, it creates a larger thermal lesion um, than a typical radio frequency lesion because you're trying to pick up as much of the, of the territory of these nerves as possible because you really can't see them um, this is just showing the probe and how the nerve or how the, the lesion is not only uh, next to the probe, but is also deep as well, because these nerves are embedded in ligaments. And this again, showing the now, there's a lot of questions coming in. Can I ask okay. a few questions? Yeah, please. Okay. And Dr. Rob and Dr. Susie, feel free to um, uh, ask this question. One, I have one question. Does the patient lose flexibility? and or range of motion after SI joint fusion. And I would extend that. Does the patient lose range of motion after a um, radio frequency uh, ablation? Dr. Rob, radio frequency ablation? There, there should be no loss of motion with radio frequency ablation. You're basically just severing nerve connections. So the <clears> signal <throat> from the joint shouldn't be coming back to the brain basically. And, and so the joint still has its normal motion, 
that it would have had before. It just isn't signaling pain. Um, uh, another question. What, One second, wait. Dr. Braxton. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I forgot. I forgot. That's all right. <clears throat> SI fusions, um, by definition, remember the SI joint has a minimal degree of rotation, two to four degrees, and 1.5 or less than 1.5 millimeters of translation. Um, to the point that you can't even see it on imaging the motion. So you should not lose any flexibility or range of motion after SI fusions. I've, I've done this on professional athletes without any issues. Now, the caveat to this is if you've had a long lumbar fusion and we have to fuse you to the pelvis and there is a device, um, there are multiple devices that you can fuse to the pelvis, then you lose a significant degree of mobility. But an SI joint minimally invasive fusion standalone by itself does not affect range of motion or, or mobility. There's another one there. Does SI joint cause numbness and or pain in one or both legs? It can cause numbness and or pain in one or and or both legs. Correct. That is true. That is a, a true statement. Remember, there are multiple studies now that show us that we used to think the SI joint only causes back pain. However, now we've realized that it can reproduce the same type of symptoms as a herniated disc, which is numbness, tingling pain down the leg as well. And since you have two SI joints, you can have both SI joints dysfunctional and therefore symptoms down both legs. And I just would like to add something to that, uh, Dr. Susalian. And I think it's important for patients to know that the SI joint can't pinch nerves um, that it's more of a uh, referred pain or maybe irritation of the sciatic nerve, which is very in close proximity to the sacroiliac joint. Um, so, but obviously we'd always want to evaluate to make sure there's not a neural impingement up higher in the spine before we'd assume it's the SI joint. I think we can move on. I think I got all these yeah. others answered. So this is just the last slide I have just showing some le a lesioning technique around the, the SI joint. And, and th this procedure is not permanent because the nerves do regrow. Um, you can't burn them from their origin. Um, uh, and it doesn't close the door to doing an SI joint fusion if it's not effective, but um, because the nerves are peripheral nerves, they will regenerate. And on average, it's about a 10 to 12 month duration. So it's a management tool. It's not a quote fix for SI joint pain. And that's all I have from my perspective. That's wonderful. That's wonderful, Dr. Ava. That's a very beautiful slide and very nice uh, x-ray result that you have there. Um, is there any way that you can allow me to share my screen for one more slide? Sure, certainly. <clears throat> Dr. Susan, while we're waiting for your slide, I've got a, a more technical uh, question for you, a personal question. Oftentimes when I do fusions, I use uh, computer-assisted surgery or navigation. As do I. Uh, and, my, and my preferred place, placement of the percutaneous pin is in the posterior superior iliac spine. Do you, uh, do you know if there's any studies or research that shows that if, if you, that percutaneous pin crosses the SI joint, that it puts the patient at an increased risk of uh, sacroiliitis or SI joint pain. I was just curious of what you thought about that. Sorry, I'm... Are you following the question? Um, you know, when you put the perk pin in and um, I usually do it on, on landmarks, sometimes it crosses the SI joint. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just trying to get good purchase into, into, into the patient's anatomy so that we get a reliable um, imaging or navigation during the case. So I was wondering if, if there's any studies that show that doing that um, um, could, could put a patient at risk of getting SI joint pain. So the answer to that right now is we don't have a study that, that shows that. The biggest thing is if you, um, to do a lot of SI joint fusions, there's a lot of surgeons out there who actually put that, this is by the way, just so you know, what I went to get, I didn't, I wasn't ignoring you. I went to, a, I went to get a model of the spine. Um, this is, is missing the other half of a pelvis here. This is the ilium, this is the sacrum, and this is the SI bone sacroiliac joint fusion. And what Dr. Braxton is talking about is 
when we uh, do a lot of our fusions, we navigate now. We use computer assistance. And one of the coolest ways of doing that is you put a percutaneous, really tiny pin through the ilium over here, and sometimes it crosses the SI joint. Um, a lot of people actually do the SI fusions with that pin in. So the answer is no, but potentially if you're, if we do an L5 S1 fusion or longer fusion, including the sacrum without including the pelvis, but the percutaneous pin in, of its, in and of itself, there's no good study. And that's a great question to show that it increases the probability of adjacent segment sacroiliac joint dysfunction. You know, thank you. I, by the way, I don't do my fusions with navigation, even though I do all, all my other surgeries with navigation. I go what we call old school and I use x-rays. Um, I like live imaging for navigation because there's a lot of forces at play. It's a great question. Um, can you, can everyone see my screen? So I'm going to try this out. Uh, it's a video and it's, it's a few minutes if we have it. And if everyone could just Bear with me for this for this little video. I'm gonna try to try to get this going. Can you guys hear? No, you got to, um, we can't hear the sound. If you take your mouse, bring it to the top of the screen under options, you have to, you can say, um, uh, you can sh share the sound too. The computer audio. Thank you, Dr. Braxton. Is, is this working? I had the hear now? Surgery, uh, about a year ago. I started having back pain about five years ago. I was fishing with my son and we'd been fly fishing up in this canyon. As soon as I stepped on the trail, it just turned into a scree and I fell down a cliff that was maybe 10 feet. Went down pretty hard, uh, felt like lightning went through my body uh, when I hit. You know, about uh, in January of 2019, I was just getting the mail on my way to work and I slipped on some ice. My leg kind of landed the same way I did when I fell down the cliff. and. Um, Things got a lot worse at that point. The pain in my back affected everything about my life. I mean, I I went from being happy and married and uh, you know spending a lot of time doing things with my kids to uh, not being able to work full time. You know, my marriage failed. Everything kind of came apart. I wasn't even able to get to all my kids' events. I tried a lot of treatments for my pain. I mean, the first thing that happened was somebody handed me a bottle of pills, right, and said, uh, you know, it'll go away. Call us. In a, in a month, um, that didn't really help. I tried um, physical therapy. I tried um, cortisone shots. Um, you know, at least 12 of them, um, maybe more. Um, I did RF fibrillation at least twice. I'm trying to think. I maybe even three times that I did that, and um, it just temporary relief at best. It just didn't hold. I mean, the only time that anything helped at all was one of the cortisone shots was done in my SI joint and that probably should have been assigned to somebody that it was uh, that that was where my problem was but people were focused on my discs. I had had um, a problem with L4 L5 many years ago and um, when I fell they were just totally focused in on that had to be where the problem was. I think what I remember probably most is I'm used to walking into a doctor's office or having a doctor walk in and they start looking at the, the MRIs or the x-rays or something like that. And doctors came in and you asked me a few questions and then started manipulating my legs. And that was the first time somebody had actually done anything to see, you know, mechanically if there was something wrong. Everybody had just assumed that it was a, a lumbar disc problem of some kind. I'm Dr. Fotis Suslian. I'm a board certified neurosurgeon with fellowship training in complex and minimally invasive spine surgery. I find the sacroiliac joint fascinating in, the, in that it is one of the largest joints in the body and unfortunately is also one of the most undiagnosed or misdiagnosed causes of treatable low back pain. SI joint pain is caused by an increase in the micro motions that happen 
in the usually very stable sacroiliac joint. When someone is being evaluated for low back pain, most physicians only include two things in their differential, which includes the lumbar spine and the hip joint. And when these two aspects are normal, patients can go undiagnosed for years, like Todd. In my practice, around one third of patients who are sent to me to rule out the lumbar spine as the cause for their back pain is actually SI joint pain. I'm also referred a lot of patients with long lumbar fusions or undiagnosed reasons for still having severe low back pain that have SI joint pain and require an SI joint fusion. Even if someone is the perfect candidate for an SI fusion, I still treat them like I would treat my own family, meaning you will not get surgery unless you've exhausted all conservative measures. This includes physical therapy, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, further therapeutic and or diagnostic injections. In the right patient who falls under the guidelines for SI joint pain, this is we the have surgery, clinically by the way. supported <clears throat> surgery now thanks to iFuse. I mean, having back surgery is certainly a, you know, a serious thing to take on, but I, I felt like the way Dr. Seuss explained just made it easy for me to understand and be ready for and um, really at ease when I was going into the surgery that, that this was gonna be the answer for me. You know, between the, the iFuse and, uh, you know, implant and Dr. Seuss land, I, I certainly got my life back. If you believe you or someone you love has SI joint pain, I would love to have the opportunity to be part of your care. Thanks guys for uh, letting me uh, show that video. Um, we missed one question, I apologize. So they, they asked it twice, uh, so I wanna make sure we get it done. Uh, Sandy says, um, when I had my L5 S1 injections, you had to go in without contrast as I was truly allergic to contrast. Can you do that as well in SI joint if necessary? Um, you can, but you're not gonna be entirely confident that you're actually in the joint without actually seeing a, uh, the articular flow within the joint or, or an arthrogram. Um, you can make an assumption that you're in the joint in that scenario, um, you probably would be better off doing a bunch of lateral branch blocks. May I ask a question here really quickly? Um, how about CT guided SI joint injections? CAT scan guided? I, I suppose they can be done. I've never utilized CAT scan. Um, I, I would think it's probably not as uh, it's, it's probably as precise, but maybe not as user friendly um, to do a CT guided injection, maybe a little more time consuming. There's, so the only thing I would say to that is that I, I agree it's there's more finickiness and there's a radiation dose for, for that. But um, for the most part, 98% of people, 99% are not allergic to contrast. Um, you know, contrast is the gold standard. It, it is the best practice. But if you are allergic to contrast, CAT scan guided is what I would say in the, in the joint. Because if you get a, if you do a radio frequency ablation or lateral branch uh, injection to try to see if you are a candidate for an SI joint fusion, at least most insurance companies will deny it. And people like me who are surgeons like me who are very conservative um, and like Dr. Braxton are very conservative will not operate on you unless you've had a proper true uh, you uh, formula, you, you follow the guidelines and the blueprint of the randomized control trial and get that intra-articular SI joint injection. we got a question from uh, Bill. Uh, I'm going to ask him, he's raising his hand. I'm going to ask him just, just for the work, for the flow of this uh, webinar, just to type your question either in questions or in comments, and we'll make sure they get read out. Out loud. So Bill could... Um, just type out his question. I think we got time for one or two more questions and um, we're gonna have to sign off and get let people get on with their evening. 
Okay, uh, I got a question from uh, Darcel. Am I mistaken in the belief that we need a certain amount of movement in the SI joint for normal walking? Uh, either Dr. Rob or Dr. Susan, or maybe both of you guys can make a comment. The question is, do we need a certain amount of movement in the SI joint for normal walking? Dr. Rob. Um, I, that's a good question. Uh, honestly, I, I don't think the SI joint moves that much that it would impair your ability to walk. You probably would compensate with your hips. Um, you know, I, I honestly never really thought about that, to be quite honest with you. Dr. Susleyan, do you have anything to add to that? So it's a, uh, I agree, Dr. Rob, it's a, it's a great question. And uh, the problem is, is that the, an the, the easy answer is no, um, you don't need that SI joint to move and you can prove it by looking at, at the studies. Don't, don't take my advice, don't take just one surgeon or one spine person's advice on this, you look at the studies, patients with severe debilitating low back pain to the, due to the SI joint are finally able to go back to work, are finally able to be off of narcotics, are finally able to, um, to move around and go back to athletic um, uh, athleticism, et cetera, after fusing, fusing the SI joint. So a uh, short answer is no, it should not affect your, your walking unless maybe you're an Olympic athlete, you know, who's a power walker. I, I can't, that I'd have to I'd have to look at the literature a little bit more deeply. But if you're an Olympic athlete who's a power walker, raise your hand and let me know, and I'll, I'll definitely look into that. That was a really good question. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to give um, our um, great uh, our participants who uh, stuck with us the whole time a chance to ask one more question. Um, again, um, we'd be happy to see you in our office. Um, just give us a call for an appointment. I think we can, um, I can uh, broadcast a number in the chat. Actually, uh, if, if Rachel's still on, if she can put in the chat to everyone the, uh, the, the best number to call to schedule an appointment, either for uh, myself. I, 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 I was a little bit um, older in my training before Dr. Susian and we didn't, I didn't get a lot of exposure to SI joint fusion. And um, so I never really picked it up. Uh, we were trained in the dark ages that it wasn't very common, but I was very surprised to see that it happens in 20 to 30% of patients. So I tend to send my patients to Dr. Susian who need this additional workup. Um, looks like we got another question. Okay. Uh, from Denise, haven't been able to feel my left foot for five or six years. Are you saying that could come back? Dr. Susian or Dr. Rob, we, we have a, a So question. sorry, is there more to that question? Um, you know, did something happen? Was there a trauma? Was there a herniated disc? Was there surgery? Um, uh, it would be wonderful to get a little bit more background to this question. Yeah. Um, I don't have much more than that. I would say that if there's a complete injury and your foot is anesthetic, you can't feel it. Oh. We have a follow on. I do have herniated discs, but no relief. So I have the, the, this, this question from Denise is, I, I haven't been able to feel my left foot for five to six years. Are you saying that could come back? I do have a herniated disc, but no relief. My SI joint really bothers me. Sounds like this patient needs to make an appointment, but do you guys have any, uh, any input to, to this uh, question? Uh, so Denise, number one, I'm sorry that uh, you've been suffering for so long. And number two, uh, between uh, the, the three providers here, we can, we can help you out and to preserve your um, HIPAA uh, and be compliant. I, I won't, you know, hit you with more questions that could potentially, um, you know, uh, uh, delve into maybe a HIPAA issue. So if you'd like, uh, we, can, we can give our telephone numbers, et cetera, but rest assured, we can help you. Yeah, that this is a, what you're describing is something that um, I have seen something Dr. Rob and something Dr. Braxton has seen, and, and it, unfortunately, it, it, is, it is treatable. Okay, so um, sounds like uh, this, <laughs> uh, the response is yay, I'm in. <laughs> All right. So, okay. hey, we had a, we had a great um, uh, audience. I really want to uh, thank, thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Susian, who is with Neuro One, who works uh, 
primarily at uh, St. Anthony's at, uh, in Lakewood. Uh, Dr. Rob, who's my partner at Vail Summit Orthopedics and Neurosurgery. We have offices in Frisco, Vail and Edwards. The numbers um, are all on the, the chat. I'm not gonna bore everybody and read the numbers. You can also search uh, Google VS Ortho or Vail Summit Orthopedics or Dr. Susan and get our contact numbers for an appointment. But this is a, a, something that uh, I, I think is overlooked and I, and I try to make a point to, uh, to evaluate it. That as well as a hit before I do a spine operation, especially a fusion or artificial disc of the spine. And uh, I, was really, I learned a lot during this uh, session. I was really, I'm really thankful for our panelists. Uh, thanks, thanks guys. I think we're uh, gonna end the questions there, but please feel free to make an appointment.